hunter brother incredible story the rediscovery of the old creek of the oldest creek uh, syllabary as I just introduced it under the name of Elimia B. Thanks to its deciphering, the Greek language, which is still spoken in Athens and other way, has proven now to be the oldest, la oldest known language in the world. Our knowledge starts about 1,600 1, before and goes to two, just up to up to date. And there's no no break in so to say in, in, in this story, whereas old Egypt, Egyptian or Sumerian or Akkadian or Los and the last Aramaic villages in Syria or under heavy fire. <coughs> These names, Linea A and Linea B, both go back to the other events who since 1899 uh, excavated the famous labyrinth at Knossos and the harbor of Amnisos and other places. And he found two related but not identical uh, symbols, systems A and B, neither of which he tried to decipher or to understand. The only thing which could be told from scratch was that all these clay tablets were not intended to, to stay. They were all burned down and burned hard and burned so that they could that they could survive the, the, the times. But the fact that they have had been burned was a military contingency, unfriendly fire. We are, we are quite sure that the, the, the that linear A was a culture dominated by a language not Indo-European, that, and that is to say it hasn't been decided up to now, no way almost. Whereas linear B seems to be the syllabary of the conquerors of the culture of Linear A and in 1942 a brilliant young English architect somehow involved in World War II John Bentley, did a marvelous thing after some American Preparations. You could show that Linear B was a syllabary whose underlying language was a very archaic, the, the earliest archaic form of Greek. And this brought, as I say, our historical knowledge of Greek back to back about 800 years from Homer's time, 800 uh, to, uh, to the destruction and uh, over and conquest of, of, of Knossos.
before I come back to the cool and sad details of details of writing systems, let me just uh, remind you, remind the, the dolphins and the flowers and the dancing young men and the topless young priestesses in, on the fresco walls of Knossos and other where. <coughs> Our last uh, tablets in the Nyabi are datable around 1200 before. And this is a very, probably the most important date in the ancient history of Europe and near e e Asia. <coughs> About the same time as Knossos uh, burned and was, was burned and came down, the civilizations or cultures of Uvarit came down of Knoss, of, of Mykene on the Greek mainland, Pylos on the same mainland, Troja on the near Asiatic coast, Hatusha I mentioned as the capital of the Hattic, Hattic kingdom and the pharaonic system of Egypt barely survived. Let me say this so much. Forgive me and my self restoration efforts. But the, by, this deciphering was a very brilliant exploit, and some ideas I should probably give you. Generally spoken, Vendris had been part of the British war effort in the Second World War, and obviously had worked as a navigator for Bletchley Bart, the, the British anti-German decipherment secret service center between Cambridge and Oxford. And from there it seems that he learned some, some professional tricks. Looking for proper names, at, in, in first instance, in this case, not for the name of generals like Guderian or Rommel, but for well-known city names like Knossos, Amnisos, Vaistos, and others, and, and put, trying to put visible symbols on the one, one hand together with possible such readings on the other hand. Second principle, making guesses about the type of language that you have to decipher as script. And so, when this look for, for two syllable sequences which we could translate as Petrus and Petra, for instance, or Peter and and it, it's and his female correspondent, which would be hmm? And then, in having found this opposition between a male 
and a female name with the same root, uh, meditating about which kind of language can this possibly be, has Semitic language with male-female difference? Difference? No, normally not. So, high probability, probability from in the Germanic language or in the European language. And finally, it was Greek. And still, while, while Ventris still deciphered and deciphered, uh, the American archaeologist Carl Blagan uh, worked in, in, in Kylos on the Peloponnesus and, and found the, against all skepticism, the brilliant, most brilliant corroboration ever found. At the same time, when when Mendris proposed for some sequence of syllables, we are reading Kiri Podi, three pod, three pod as in Delphi, for instance. Uh, Carl Blagan discovered a tablet where this where this six where this sequence of symbols showed up, but with an iconographical representation showing something with three legs or three. So the reading was about, about all down, up. <coughs> it couldn't be poor chance as many people before had pretended. And you learn just one more thing from this transcription theory body. Surely the old Greeks didn't pronounce it like that, but they said three body, as we all say three for three and three. <coughs> but this This vocalic syllable is this vocalic correct, I would almost say, was unable to write other syllables than open syllables. Open syllables are syllables formed by the absolute trivial rule, consonant first. Vowel following. T, Re, Po, T. No turning around, no, no three, Po, T, or no, no chance to begin with the vowel and start with the and end with the consonant as it would be suitable for the local name of Amnitsos, but no way. <coughs> this sounds, for, 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 by first hearing, this sounds <coughs> very restrictive, and it is very restrictive. It makes it 
impossible to to write hexameters. This is the point. Hexameters are defined by the alternation of open and closed syllables. And if you can't, and if you and if you deform closed syllables like three by expressing them as open ones, T re, you destroy the prosodical metrical formula of the hexameter as such. Which has consequences for for all what, 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 what will follow in our course here. And for the for the Japanese among us, I hope they are. It's an amusing by remark that the Cretans were unable to distinguish between R and L, as the Japanese do in transcribing European names and so my name, for instance. This unsuitedness for poetry and prosodic purposes uh, seems to be very natural. I don't think it is so, uh, but I forget to mention and to stress how, how prosaic, prosaic and how bureaucratic uh, these uh, inventories of many, many burnt clay tablets used to be. There are lists about 50 female slaves imported from the island of Lesbos to Pylos. There are lists about warriors and officers and uh, imminent enemies and how to prepare for war. There are very agrarian notice on how many olives and honey has been delivered by the peasants to the powerful or by the, or, or by the priests to the gods and the goddesses. I think this one, the Didi body was also a monument that said five tripods for the goddess so and so and five honey jars and also a jar with a jar. Yeah. Yeah, my, my favorite table from Knossos. One amphora of honey for all lot. One other amphora of honey for the goddess of the labyrinth. That is to say, she is more, she's, she equals or tendermans all the other gods. <coughs> but to come back to this, uh, Factical and empirical side of the inscriptions, which have never met, which has never, which nevertheless has something to do with, with the Greek poetry. Um, only two years ago, in the region of Sparta, in Laconia, near Amuplai, uh, has has made has been made a very unusual find of, of, of tablets, not inside a burn, burned or destroyed royal palatial building, but just on the field as if people flying had thrown away their tablets and so. <coughs> and, and what is inscribed on the tablets? That that 500 daggers are, are in play 
And when the when the diggers excavate further, the 500 diggers came into <coughs> into into view, which wouldn't have been good for olives or honey and all this perishing perishable stuff, uh, which is usually the content of the tablets. And in the good years when the European community still supported the Republic of Korea's life uh, as, as it <coughs> as, as a baby in its cradle. Solvency was on its way, but not declared. In 1993, the European Community decided to modernize the water system of one of the most sacred and holy acropolis ever thought of, the Katmaya of Haven. Sea by sea bay. Okay. <coughs> but it's in Italian. Thames. Tebe in Italian is Tebe. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's yeah. Tebe. I think it's Tebe. Yes. Thames. 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 Thames in English. Yes. Yeah. You should have heard it in, in the course of yeah. on, on the tragedy, all the tragedy. Yeah. Every second tragedy has taken yeah. place on the Katmaya. And what came, and, and a very sens sensational object came into sight, a list of local names, thieves, other small places in in the surroundings on the near island. And these Ortsnamen, these local names. Names of places. These names of places uh, were all known to us from the second song of Homer's Iliad. Unfortunate in the famous catalogue of ships. The Greeks attacking, starting uh, from, from the region of Thebes in order to go to Troya uh, and fight. Okay, this is at first sight, this is no, it seems no wonder, but if you take into account that, except the local name of Thebes, or the six or seven other local names, and registered on this little tablet, and named by Homer, are totally unknown to the Greek anti-theographers, mythographers, nobody has any idea where they are. And now they are proved as simple rural, rural entities producing olives and 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 money and, and not money or honey, honey honey and and the and the. So how could Homer know this? In our before we end in fifteen minutes, I have to put my cards on the table. <coughs> I 
I start from two premises, convictions. The first one is common sense. The second one is highly controversial. The common sense is that we now, since small time, that we now can be sure that the adaption of the Semitic consonant alphabet by the Greek vocalic alphabet took place relatively precisely around 800, uh, most probably on the island of Euberia. This is archaeological, archaeologically uh, rather assured. And the second most controversial hypothesis would be the hypothesis of my friend uh, Barry Powell, University of Wisconsin. This alphabet was adapted for the sake and for the love for Homer, of Homer. And if this would be so, this is, it could be very decisive. <coughs> what I try to, what I try to do, suggest about Oriental despotism and the Minoan, Mycenaean, Mycenaean bureaucracy was not too far away from this. Um, Homer's poetic new new creation of a culture would be the other the free aspect of high culture. Herodotus, the inventor or the first historian, says that in the case of Greeks, it has, it has been poets and not priests who have given their gods the names and the functions and the attributes. <coughs> so for, from the from the gift of the gods and from the gift of the alphabet there follows nothing more than to honor the gods and free and love the poet and the, the examiners and the poet, the poetry. You haven't to go you haven't to kneel down in the direction of Mecca or and so on and so on. But I'm goes by and I, I have to become rather down to earth once again. As far as we can, first statement, as far as we can tell, this invention has been done on the worldwide on a worldwide scale just once. There's no parallel story of the of an vocalic alphabet. So many syllabaries have been developed in the East and West, so many not phonetic systems, but the introduction of five vowels and later seven vowels into the consonant, the order consonant least named alphabet was unique, and the extension of from five to seven had clear prosthetic reasons. The Greeks wanted to distinguish between the short O and the long O and the short E and the long E because, as I said, the longness or shortness of syllables and, and vowels made up the very, the very
web of their of their poet of their poetics. And here I may add the point I forget to make while talking about about the island of Crete and the Mykenian culture. Das muss ich machen. Sie sind ja nicht, ich nehme mal an. Now, it, now you can just like my hamper. Okay, you go ooh, Bobby, you go ooh. Mm -hmm. This is a logical goet, two-dimensional goet, uh, lying behind the Minoan and uh, linear B system. I swear, to the, I swear to the God and the goddesses that these five symbols A, E, I, O and U exist as such for the first time in writing history, as far as I can tell. And then after have, having been be isolated as pure vowels, they can be combined by, by rather mechanical rules to, op to opening consonants, building the closed list of open syllables writable in linear B. <coughs> and that the adapter of the non-vocalic <coughs> consonant alphabet coming somewhere from Ugarit or uh, of, not from Jerusalem in any, in any case, um, introduced this conscious or unconscious knowledge of single consonant, single vowels as possible uh, scriptural values into into in, into this already counted and finalized sign system made it was so, so, so to say the blossoming the the arrival of a new day. This total alphabetical analysis up to the very single sound is surely less natural or less common than syllabaries, but maybe it has been necessitated by the Indo-European root system, at least in the old Homeric times. <clears throat> I read the formula almost in, in the dispensable if you produce epic poetry. In, in Homeric Greece is AO. Consonant alphabet, nothing would be left. No single trace of it.
as a rule of, rule of thumb, you can, you can retain the Semitic language system is based on consonants and that's its glory. And the old European, Indo-European language system, it's, it's, it's based on vowels and it's, and this is, is its glory. <coughs> And before I go into the systematic uh, aspects of this difference, uh, let's make it audible on the poetic aspect. As every good scholar of the Odyssey knows, uh, the the first line of the two sirens in the twelfth, uh, twelfth book of the, Udys of the Odyssey is certainly the most wonderful examiner ever produced. How? It's, it's obviously enough. Two, two young ladies, nymphs, whose job is just to sing in order to sing, la pour la. They produce the most wonderful line, and that's why I know it by rote, exceptionally. And I have to quote it <coughs> before translating. Doi garion poluaino do seu megacudos acai. Now imagine this written down in a consonantic alphabet. Hi, come to us. Ulysses, full of riddles, for one. Megacudos are tired. Just more than famous. That's why I hesitate and doubt. Odysseus as a as a great brilliance among the Achaeans, among the Greeks. But Kudos is not just is, is more than Kleos, is more than fame. Mm -hmm. Kudos is an attribute of the gods, and fame is an attribute of the heroes. And as we have very little chance to become gods, but some chance to become heroes. As David Bowie added, let's stay at this point. Have you have you got the argument? I should. It's it's it's, it's the most important one. syllables, we decide like, like Mary had a little lamb. There is no division between short and long vowels. Yeah. Whereas in ancient Greek, um, the hexameters were formed by short and long syllables. That's the big difference to yeah. how we make poetry nowadays. Yeah. And it's, it's only possible when you have this distinction yeah. between... This is what I try to, to imitate in my... In my in my bad Saxon Greek. Doi, Agio, Oluai, Odusei, 
Mega cool, dat is ook I think so, you get a little feeling for, for the beat of the great poetry, and which was music at the same time. And so. And so, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we have to pause and to see you again half, half an hour too early. The difference to the, in contrast to the others. And we work and work until we fall asleep in intercooperation. <laughs>
final thing you should never do or uh, is imagine the, these early Greek manuscripts as I date them from 1800 before in the form of our classical uh, Greek editions done by Oxford or Cambridge or Lowell or so. There were for centuries or for millennia, there were no small letters, just big ones, majuscules. There were no spaces between the words. There were no accents in order to distinguish uh, vowel value, vowel values. It, it was just a scriptura continua, an ongoing script, probably as a, just as a support for the voice, because reading in ancient Greece meant reading loud, aloud. Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche has made this point ever and ever again and again. <coughs> These points are probably well suited to give you an idea how, how already based this culture uh, did function never, never never standing its uh, literalization by the alphabet. Powell's hypothesis uh, can be hold, and I believe so. Then Homer was written down in his lifetime, circa 800 before our era, as the first poet to be written down or dictating to this adapter from Semitic uh, to Indo-European sound system. Homer, like all the other bards or rhapsodes, was illiterate, but in, in the last decade, uh, phonology has been able to do wonderful things on the Iliad. You may have known that Richard Bentley in 1713 uh, discovered the missing letter in, 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 in the Homeric manuscript. The missing letter whose introduction made all prosodic problems disappear. If you don't read Oinos for wine, but Oinos for wine, as, and with, this, with this W at the, at the start, you, you, you got the original sound. And this was Richard Bentley's discovery, the D gamma, the D gamma, double gamma, like W in the English pronunciation. <coughs> and from, from Bentley's heroic first lead on, philologists have been able to go back and back into the Iliadic formulas. I don't know, I don't speak about the uh, Odyssean formulas. And we can ascertain nowadays that in the Ilias, the Ilias, Greek and proper names show up which are older than the ERP. So that we come phonetically uh, to, uh, to the epoch about 1700 before.
so, so incredibly true or boy. Tasteful. Huh? Tasteful. Uh, this oral memory of the bars seems to have been. <coughs> and all the more it remains an enigma why this long standing relation between the Iliad on the one hand and the Minoan and Mycenaean civilization on the other hand has, has been totally forgotten or erased or left on the, on, on the silence. For 400 years, after the destruction of all these uh, Minoan and Mycenaean centers and the rediscovery of the vowel alphabet, there's no sign. No sign of sign in no sign of signs in, in Greece anymore, and the only allusion to something like writing, not writing in the strict sense, is is a little an anecdote in the Iliad where it which anecdote deals with baleful signs, faithful signs. You can suppose these are the written signs. You can't be sure. Lucra <coughs> semaina. On the on the very irritating uh, persistence of Minoan proper names and local names and names of places uh, in the catalog of ships second song of the Iliad, I already made my remarks. <coughs> so I, I try to give a final touch to this Homeric studies in the Kiglerian sense, if I may say so, because it's rather risky what I do here. <coughs> I'd say that if Paul is not mistaken, the Iliad is, Iliad is older than the Odyssea, and the Iliad has been dictated by some illiterate poet to somebody who wrote it down with his newly created vocalic alphabet. And, on the, and let's say 50 years ago, Later, sorry, thank you. Fifty years later, in 740-760, somebody, a Homeric son, probably maybe a son of Homer, <coughs> put down the Odyssey in a, in a way where the poet himself was able to read the Iliad and to listen to the effect of the Iliad on its hearers. <coughs> and so the Odyssey is full of music and singers and nymphs and sirens and every calypso and Kirke, everybody sings and tempts by singing and charms by singing in the Iliad you are just Hear the brutal sound of war, fair, and the, and the cries of dying men. <coughs> so you could, could say that the Odyssey is the first self reflection of European poetry. Odyssey listens to the prosodic and oral and poetic effect of the Iliad on its new, newly created hearers and readers. <coughs> and in the famous case of the two sirens, the song listens to itself. These are it is explicitly 
said that they are two sirens in order to describe the wonderful event <coughs> that out of two mouths comes one voice. This is a precise formulation the sirens then says, give of their song. You can imagine an octave or something like this. Two, two nymphs singing the same song line, one in alto and the other in soprano, as a possible implementation of this, of this duet. <coughs> And so, you, so, as we just saw, uh, this is, this, the sirens invent music, and Kierke invents magic, and Ulysses invents uh, adventure tales and brilliant lies. For instance, the lie that he never entered the sirens' island. And in the line of these heroic or mythical inventors, they are also show up inventors of the alphabet. A certain Palamedes, enemy of, Odysseus, of, of, of Ulysses uh, under the conditions of the Trojan War. Prometheus, or Prometheus, as you say, probably, in the case of Aeschylus, um, Prometheus, bounded. And these are no gods, half gods, demi gods, demons, but no gods as taught in Egypt or, or Marduk in Babylon. These are heroic. Humans and mortals bringing mortals light, fire, writing, and other uh, considerations of high culture or culture in general. And on top of all these uh, mythical self representations of uh, the Greek culture, I see the myths of Cadmus, Cadmus and his wife, Harmonia. Cadmus, the Phoenician bringer of the alphabet to Thebes. Harmonia, the daughter the mortal daughter of Aphrodite and, and Ares, that is of love and war. Harmonia as, as bringing together symphony and dysphony or musical so, salvation and musical tension. So I'd say the wedding of Cadmus and Harmonia is has been thought as a union of the alphabet and music in general. And that's why this famous wedding on the Cadmeia in Thebes was the last wedding of humans where of mortals where all the gods and all the muses and all the nymphs showed up and danced with them on the on the night the Agora of the in our days we, attempt, we expect these wonders in vain. <coughs> and the only wonder which which has been conserved in in Powell's words, is the, is, is, is the Iliad itself, it's, it's difficult to explain, we, we find in the, in the earth, we find in the Greek soil, little, rotten, half-broken 
fragments of writing Abecidaria or what, what else you have, and you take it on the side of the archaeological uh, epigraphical uh, documentary system. And on the other hand, you have the Iliad, earliest manuscripts about 400, 500 before, no, doc, no archaeological text, naturally they're not, uh, before this time. And nevertheless, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey are, 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 such, are, are so verbatim and, and have so have, and have undergone so few changes, textual changes in now about 3,000 years, so that we are in, in some right to put these documentary sources into the monumentary sources, the, the sources of, of, mater, of, of archaeological materiality. Notwithstanding the fact that the Athenian democracy uh, was very inventive in propagating the idea that Homer had not be, been written down before the uh, Athenian despot Pisistrates gave the command in uh, 520 about. But let the Athenians lie as they lie. I go on in my, in my most beloved chapter. What are these early uh, Greek fragmentary inscriptions we, we got out of the soil? Abecidaria, proper names, uh, small obscene inscriptions, very interesting. Uh, A. Male name, Faxby, another male name. This is, for, this is from the island of Sira, uh, next to the uh, gymnasium. You may imagine why <laughs> obscene inscriptions and, and, and gymnastic inscriptions are the same things. But the, but the overwhelming part of the remaining Longer inscriptions are not are poetic, are done in hexameters, hexameters, not in any else meter, have nothing to do with political or commercial reasons. Commercial reasons for the uh, most accepted. Uh, view on the adaption of the Semitic letters to the Greek culture. I think <coughs> let, let, let's let's make it let's make my argument very short. Um, these philologists who've, who have explained the origin of the Greek our alphabet by the, far far, by the interests of far commercial uh, sailors and so on. Uh, without knowing it, have been slaves of the capitalist ideology. They can't ju just, they, they, are un they are just unable to, unable to Imagine a culture which is more interested in poetry than in commerce. But the early Greeks seem to have been this crazy poetic culture. And I give you just one famous inscription which has some relation to the Odyssey. It was discovered in 1953, I think. On the island of Ischia, Pitaikusa, the island of the apes, in the Gulf of Naples. And these are, this is one jambus and two hexameters, and it runs like this 
Nestoros aimi, Nestoros aimi poteron, oi poteron. Wer ja. immer. I, I am Nestor's cop. Whoever drinks from me will be seized on the spot by the desire of beautiful um, of, 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 of dull crowned Aphrodite. Whoever drinks I should have, I should, have, I should have written it down in, in this wonderful outcry. Autika Hairetai Himeros Kari Stefanu Aphrodites. It is simply the old trinity of wife, wine, and song. And nothing else. And the, and the, the gag of the scene, Nestor's cock, is a, shows up in the Iliad and has a height of about one meter. And the and only the hero Nestor can bring it up to his the drinking mouth. Whereas this uh, Nestor's cock, so-called Nestor's cock, uh, discovered in a little grey on the island of Istia, it's just uh, Tanya. Yeah, just a tiny, <laughs> so it's so it's a joke in in, in, in final analysis. But not but, but an interesting joke because uh, if you take it uh, by by its plain text, it's first quotation in European literature. It's the first. Uh, Intertextual allusion, as post-structuralists would like to see and say. I'm, I'm more interested. I'm not so much interested in the history of quotation marks, and so I'm interested in the power of Aphrodite. And in order to bring, up, in order to bring you near this poetic dimension of these three lines written on ne ne Nestor's cup. Uh, the second last word, Tali Stefanu Aphrodites, is for the first time uh, written with a double lambda. It's not Tali Stefanu as, as, as many old uh, ancient inscriptions would have it, uh, but Tali Kappa Alpha Lambda E Yota would be two open syllables, but we need a closed one for the hexameter. And so Kalli Stefanu with double lambda. The, the text has been written in order to be sung. <coughs> And I will give you a transcription of this very famous fragment, which is all, almost complete. Just one word is missing and easily uh, replaced or introduced. While Tanya Um, a 
as far as I can see in this um, in this global map web representation, which is missing all the separation signs between not words but, but between word groups, which make it and the separation signs vertical lines make it easier to pronounce the text. Saying this, I have to leave the wonderful dimension of the earliest Greek poetry and go over to, to the first um, methodical reflection on, on the Greek alphabet done inside Greece it, herself. But before I do so, just one remark which is hard to prove and I still keep point. On the so many half burned and half destroyed fragments of the poet Sappho found in Egypt, I believe to have almost discovered one fragment where she, for the first time, makes the difference between vowels and consonants. So, and, and this would be natural enough, I'd say, that poets and poetesses are <coughs> competent by profession for these fundamental distinctions in early Greece. Long, short, high, low pitch, consonantal, vocalic, everything, all these prosodic and melodic elements have to be present in order that you can change from the epos, from the exam, exam meter, to the self-invented new melos, as Sappho invented, the Sappian short line of, of rhythmical and melodical properties and other poets, other lines. I'm sorry. All these people now who are writing your lectures, all these people who are writing your lectures on their laptops, they can't write this. What do you think about that? Got it? What do you mean by that? Uh, they can't write this. For example, I can't write this with my hand. Yes. But they can't. What do you think about that? I can't. I've, I've installed an, 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 a classical Greek font and no problem in writing Greek or Hebrew or Cyrillic Russian. I don't think anything about it. You, you have to do some practical changes in your font <laughs> administration system. I heavily re recommend the good old Donald Knuth, Stanford University, Computer Department, <coughs> Ladwig and Tech in general. It's open source. Whenever, whenever somebody discovers one bug, uh, we can we can we can tell it to to Knuth and and you and you got one dollar for having discovered a bug. But it's not <coughs> and so we we, have, we, we would be in, in, in an open source of, of writing and typographers, which is a, you touch on a, on, a, on a very heavy commercial and capitalist problem, I think. In order to steal the copyrights from the best uh, European and American uh, font uh, designers, uh, it was sufficient for Adobe and other companies to just change one bit or two bits and then the American justice system spoke of an original uh, invention. In, in, where, in truth it was sheer robbery. And, and Knuth and others uh, have fought their lifelong against this, this kind of 
intellectual property. Robert, Robert, Robert. <laughs> Still free art. We will we'll come into the dimension of Marazzo and uh, <laughs> classical poets. <laughs> 42 kilometers to do for me till I break down on the Agora of Athens. I announced just a moment ago uh, the first self application of the the Greek alphabet to itself. This is an, if we stick to our distinction between uh, intercultural and intracultural effects of symbolic systems, we are now in the second case, intracultural. And that's why it's quite difficult to give good historical reasons. But archaeologically, we can, we can be sure that in 588, in southern Italy, in Delia, on, a, on the walls of the temple, suddenly the letters of the vocalic alphabet are used as numbers. In a totally conclusive and simple way, alpha becomes one, <coughs> beta becomes two, and so and cop a very complicated copper becomes six or up the other way around. And so when we come to and and, and we, we pass from from one to nine and get, and got the Units with one uh, position in modern term terminology. And it, then we come to the Yota and we call the Yota uh, 10. And Yota, Kappa, Lambda, and so on. We call them 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. And we come to 100, and just for a moment I just forgot uh, which was 100, which, which letter, which alphabetic letter. But there's one letter, and then 100, 200, and up to 900. <coughs> so, in, so since about 600 before, the Greeks were able to write the natural numbers from 1 to 999. And no foreign influence can be detected for this self-application, self-reflection of the alphabet. But it has far-reaching consequences, not only for the Greek culture. And from this double coding of the alphabet, phonetic on the one hand, and numerical, mathematical on the other hand, there arose, I think, the possibility of what the Greeks called and still call mathematics. Mathemat mathematical activities are very old in the, on this, on this, yes. The, Greek, the Greeks were in no way ar better arithmetically than their predecessors in Babylon or in Memphis, Egypt. But they introduced some, some generalizations. And, and the first generalization was, was this equivalence between sound signs and number signs. Mm -hmm. 
by once again the famous Tetractus. was a name, something like mm, the foreness. My beloved, or not beloved, my, my, my admired teacher, Lohmann, uh, called the word Tetratis the first scientific uh, coined word in the history of, of European science. A word just made up for describing this uh, diagram with all this diagram's mathematical and musical implications. It's not just a proper name for some some ten little stones, cephoi, calculi in Latin, which chart, uh, giving the calculus in in English, for instance. But it's the whole structure discovered or described or put free by Pythagoras of Samos when he left his eastern Greek island and went to the far west to southern Italy. And there he or one of his followers or more than one of his followers discovered this imperishable system of relationships, relationships which the Greek named logoi, relations, which is a plural of logos, the holy word word for mind and soul and in general. And you can read it as a mm, musical tuning of a perfect guitar, a Greek guitar, which would give a Spanish or English or Beatles guitar in modern times. And you see in the relation between one and two on the top, the relation between the fundamental tone and the octave, you see in the relation between this two to the three, the relation between uh, the relation which now we call the fifth and the relation three to four, we now would call the fourth. And these are for the Greeks the fundamental and constant elements in the tuning of a, of of the chords. Of a, of a guitar, of a guitar, and the sounds or tune, tones in between are movable and open to improvisation by the musician. But this mathematically, mathematical and aesthetical uh, bone work has to be conserved in any or in every case in order to to bring together beauty and mathematical order, which the Pythagoreans would call harmonia as the as a myth would be true. <coughs> and from this position on, which may have been reached less at last in 500 before, it's easy to see that the Greeks must have developed, must have, they had, they simply developed, uh, out of the same alphabet, two musical notation systems. One quite simple for diatonic movements of human voices, and the second 
notation system, the same alphabet, but much more complicated. You could turn the letters around by 60 degrees, by 180 degrees. You could, you could, in order to give chromatic values to the guitar or to the audience playing this score. All these scores were monophonic, needless to say. But we had, we had, we had in, in fact, uh, how should I call it? It was a perfectly, perfectly balanced system. Just one alphabet and the three applications. Poetic. Mathematic and musical in a, in a, in a strict, in a, in, a, in a more or less strict sense. When Pindau Eisschulers uh, felt too old uh, to make the long trip from from Tapes to Syracuse, they sent their scores, their musical scores, the, the, the poetic text. I wish I could have gone the same. <laughs> <laughs> and in the following, I'll, I'll show you how this unity has, has, has been disintegrated step for step by the Romans, by the Christians, and only under conditions of Turing's computer galaxy, we, we are in a, in a state of the art analog to the Greek one, with our binary system for letters, for pitches, for lines, for equations, for what else, for pixels, for voxels. And we, we, we can not only handle and manage the different streams of data, but we can convert them one into the other and try out with the certification of a, of a visual data field would give and so on and so on. Maybe I exaggerate a little bit for didactic reasons in in in, in, in putting such an emphasis on the unity of the Greek uh, symbol system. There was one and only one thing uh, a priori, so to say, excluded from this unitarian approach to, to writing systems. You couldn't play around between geometric, uh, geometric uh, diagrams and arithmetical number systems. And algebra was unthinkable under the given uh, options of the Greek numeral system. If every number was written down as a letter, you could not do what we are going to do if we write a power 2 plus b power 2 equals c power 2. Though the only arithmetical generality accessible seems to have been the very fundamental distinction uh, between odd and even numbers. Every number is either odd or even was the most important and only 
obviously trivial statement done by Philodorus of Proton. No Babylonian, no Egyptian ever had seen any reason to separate the whole totality of natural numbers into two classes. But this doing so delivered the first proof that the square root taken out of two can't be a number, a natural number, because this number would be at the same time odd and even. This is a very famous result done by, by Euclid, with life. <coughs> and odd and even to a late antiquity plays still a role in conceiving that which is, since Aphrodite's day, the most important issue of Greek culture and life. How about the relation between women and men? Answer, look at the tetraktisch. Forget about one, forget about four. Just look at two and three. Two as the first even number, three as the first odd number. Okay? And then if you divide two by itself, or if you if you tear tear two into two parts, what what you what, what do you get in the middle? Nothing. A very very helpful, very generous nothing. And if you if you throw a throw apart the three, what 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 what, what, what does remain in the middle? A very fertile member. And so it's just a symbol of the sexual act, which the Greeks named Gamot. Gamos, to translate Gamos by wedding or by marriage would be the most silly translation ever proposed to by two library readers. And Damos then is simply the number five, the relation between two and three. This was to, in order that you don't think uh, I am usual with this minor this obscene Greek writers with, without any importance for the cultural history of Europe. Uh, what I quoted was one of the, of, of the most famous articles written by Plutarchus of Chalmonea um, about 120 after the A. Abut Delford. My let me add my mathematical friends when I told it to them, they were shocked in Berlin to, to see that the Greek mathematics it could be equally practical and sexual as the old Chinese one, for instance. <coughs> but let's go on and on, and so many hours are still to fill. Whenever you had a look at the ancient Semitic alphabetic signs, you have seen very idiosyncratic and crazy forms, very difficult to memorize, and very asymmetric or unexpected. And if you compare with classical Greek letter forms, you are tremendously surprised. Suddenly, all possible symmetries between these uh, letters, these big letters, not minor ones, uh, have, been, ha have been used and 
optimize and maximize. And the saying goes that it was Pythagoras, once again, himself, who introduced geometry into typography. And in the early classical Attica, the aristocratic agrarian landscape around Athens, the noble families invented a kind of writing system which, which probably was the optimum or maximum of, of beauty. Stoiche Don style meant that on, let's say, a marble inscription, inscription field, the inscription field was invisibly divided into equal, equidistant, vertical, and horizontal fields, and then every in every of in every one of these little bricks, one letter and just one only one letter could be put, and it was vertically and horizontally the sheer. Sheer mixture of uh, typographical beauty and some kind of military terror of the Farlands. All these young soldiers, warriors, in, in one order, one after the other, one next to the other, all intact and present, and all this. Victorious against the Spartans and so on. <coughs> what I try to say, to, what I try to suggest to you from a very from a point of view which under which among the German classical scholars is minotarian what I try to suggest is that in the Greek alphabet the order of the alphabet becomes transpar transparent diaphan to itself and after the application to mathematics and to music, uh, why, why, why not apply the alphabet to the whole of the universe, the cosmos itself, the physics, the, that, that which comes up by itself and goes back into its absence by itself. And so, Lester Svendro in Paris and I in Berlin, we think that the schema schematism of the four elements as exposed in the big so called didactic poetry done by Empedocles of Akragas is such a it's such a such a perspective through the alphabet into the free of nature. And if you look at nature, somehow inspired by Homer's poetry, uh, you see that you see four roots for Rizomatra, for everything that is. You see the splendor of the sky, which is called Zeus. You see the darkness and the fruitfulness of our Mother Earth, which is called Hira. And Zeus and Hira are a pair of loving 
and connected gods and goddesses. And if you go on and look, this all was done on the island of Sicily, and then you see the volcano as Etna throwing its underterranean hot fire into the air and having wrapped the most beautiful Kore Nymphae ever living on, on the island of Sicily. And so Hades, the invisible master of the dead, has seduced Kore Persephone and he stands for the hot fire coming from inside the earth and she stands for the beautiful warm sweet water which in Sicily comes from out from the same earth and so two, pa two pairs of, of gods Zeus and, and Hera and Hades and Kore are both linked as, as those elementary conditions which later on uh, we formalize as uh, air and and, and air, air and, and, and earth and fire and water. But for Empedocles, this still is this still is dominated or inspired by the power of goddesses. You, you, you have to, these two pairs, heterosexual pairs, but they couldn't, they couldn't have come together without Aphrodite behind them. These are Aphrodite, goddess of law, putting together these pairs, or Makos, Ares, Aphrodite is any, uh, taking these elements, uh, in separating these elements into an unmixed status. Translating the Lea of the Lotteries in Empedocles by the English word of friendship has to count with my quote. It's so obvious sexual love, Aphrodite, nothing to do with Aristotelian friendship. Every night, Aphrodite, Philotus, enters our members, is said in the text. And then we enjoy it. <coughs> so after this risky essay to connect the completeness of the Greek alphabetic system with the completeness of the element, element, element system, I pass over to the more trivial or more classical example. Sometimes short before, shortly before Plato's or Socrates' days, some philosopher, probably Democritus, went, went on and replaced the traditional word for letter, the grammar, by an by obviously new crown, coined word, uh, stoikaion elementum. Stoichos or Stoichos is, is a step and Stoichain would say step from A to B to C and so on and so on yeah, in this ordinal dimension of the <coughs> alphabet. <coughs> and finally these this so-called atomists, Leukippus and his follower Democritus, 
proposed the theory that the whole cosmos universe is made up of two elements, and only two elements, to atomon and to canon. The atoma, the atoms, as we have it in English, are the undivisible, last, invisible, small, physical elements of the world, and they are flowing around in some void, to canon. And that's why they can move around, because this void gives them some open, open space to move around and not to be fixed like uh, fixed like chicken in a chicken farm. <coughs> and I strongly propose that you take the atom on the atom on for, for the single letter and I strongly propose that you take the canon to to empty the void as the writing material, the empty writing material on which the all the letters later begin to dance. And this dance is very nicely described by these atomist philosophers because they always, oh, many times, uh, like to compare uh, letters to these physical elements or the other way around. Not all atoms are, are identical because not because the letter alpha is not the letter mu and in modern writing and a n a n an <coughs> is not the same syllable as the syllable na n r you, you, you change to uh, two letters and their sequence and you got the next um, building block of sense and, and meaning. And the most nice, the nicest example is the mu and the z and, and the zeta. In our case, simply the big N and the big z. You take the, the N, you throw it on the, on the back and you got the z. And so, for the atomists, every possible combination of physical beings in the world can be simulated, for to say, uh, by letter combinations in a, in a, in a very, uh, in, in the way of a thought experiment, all, all the, all the, almost, before my oral powers miss me, I just one famous quotation taken out of Leukippos and translated to us by the great Aristotle and misunderstood totally by Socrates. It's stupid. <laughs> the Kippos tragedy and comedy are made up of the same letter. <coughs> Chasson, tragical or if you prefer a comical effect on all poetic writing you can do. And, and it's the first philosophical statement on writing which I ever encountered. 
not just the, the relation between the four roots in amino phase and the letters is not explicit in, in the philosopher. It needed Jesper Svenbo and my minority to, to introduce this an, an, an analogy. But in Leukippos, the normal statement about tragedy and comedy, it's, it's, it's clear without any question that he, he talks at the same time about things and about signs. Le mot et les choses, and the whole tragic comedy of later Hellenistic thought would be the separation between the philosophy of philosophy of science on the one hand and the almost missing philosophy of, of things, physics on the other hand. Some comments and some and then um, some point, some point. I, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. I have an impression that uh, you, I mean, you are using kind of historical facts in the building of, uh, in, in a way to understand the communication from the past, the yeah. from the past. But how I, should I do otherwise? <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? No. no. Yeah. Uh, I have impression that uh, I mean uh, that I mean we can't just count historical facts because uh, historical uh, facts are all already constructed by some structures of power. It's not something that we can accept without any doubt. Uh, that's first. And the second thing is that even if we would take kind of historical facts or kind of traces of the culture, cultures from the past, without, uh, I mean, being suspicious, is it correct or no, there is a problem uh, in the understanding of the object as such. I mean, uh, there is a dissolution between object as a material thing and understanding of the object. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is always kind of inscription into the object. And there is a whole line of the conceptual art from the 70s and 60s, uh, can you 70s go, that was dealing with the... Can you go a little bit slower for my, <laughs> yeah, okay. for my bad English? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I was question uh, about uh, using historical facts yes. without... Uh, so far I, I, I could follow. Yeah, and the other thing, even if we would use kind of historical facts, as a material thing, so as a kind of. Did you ever do it, or? Uh, I, I have to say no, without doubt. <laughs> and uh, there is a problem with understanding the object as such. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the object is always full of the inscriptions, uh, ah. of the meanings, or I mean, there is a line of conceptual art from the seventies that was dealing with that question. Yes, but. but but for ancient Greek, so I'm sorry, there are so few inscriptions, and we are, we are so poor. But with, for with example, there was two decades ago when Israel uh, did invasion into the Jordan territory in the West uh, Bank, and they actually, just when they invade, they found the traces of the Bible. As a, probably they need the proof that they were there millions of years, uh, I mean, uh, thousands years ago. I mean, it's not something that it's it's a kind of true that it's not without interpretation. Thanks for this criminal example. <laughs> yeah, but our history is full of blood. You are skeptical of what I've implied. This is my little critique. Okay. <laughs> No, I'm just trying to understand. I and I, somehow I, I'm following I, I, you, but I feel all the time kind of limits. Uh, that is just based on the material aspect without kind of cultural consequences around the facts we are dealing with. And that's somehow stopping me to understand 
in, uh, in, my, in my mind, I gave so many uh, cultural side effects and, and perspectives for future development, but, but it, I didn't succeed in, in, in approaching you. I'm sorry, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's my personal impression, but it's a just it's a fact. And I'm, I'm you're right, or <laughs> you're right. I'm I'm strongly opposed to this constructivist uh, vision of the of the 70s and early 80s. When I once had the opportunity to meet Francisco Varela on the Pissouan, we were quite different in our opinion. <laughs> rather, it was rather frightening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a remark. This question. I think there is a difference between um, yeah, facts like the life of the Pythagoras, which we don't know much about, and the um, proofs we have about this life are what other people told centuries later or years later. So here I can see perspective of construction there, but. If you look at something like an inscription and you try to interpret it and you use structural <coughs> methods to understand like that there is um, um, a prosodic uh, influence on it or not, or what kind of letters are used, or if you compare letters, that's on a different scale, I would say. And I would try not to like this very valuable his, his, historian's remark that history is constructed does not apply to everything in the same amount. And I think you've picked out a good example, but that already shows like, oh, there's politics behind it. It's great to find evidences of the Bible in the West Bank because that proves we were here. And so the same thing applies to... Oh, sure, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's no, maybe... I, it's I just to look at the most political example. Of course, I could use yeah, it's a good one. or whatever. But it, it, despite the fact these things were found, <coughs> and will be part of our interpreters, interpretation. And um, the fact that they are displayed in something like a shrine has nothing to do with that they exist. And the Polyets, no? The Golden of the Polyets, no? Yeah. So maybe we make a break now.